you're correct. We're told every day that the referendum result has been a disaster for the economy. But let's look at the facts. We've avoided the economic Armageddon and the financial collapse that the Remain side predicted. Even though the Governor of the Bank of England, who in May of last year said there would be a technical recession if we voted to leave, changed his mind by the autumn last November when the Bank of England then revised its forecast up significantly. Perhaps the one figure that really, in my mind, was completely out of context and highlighted project fear during the referendum was the forecast from the Treasury that within one year of a vote to leave, we would lose 500,000 jobs. What have we seen? We've seen over 300,000 jobs created in the UK in that first year since the referendum result. The bulk of the, those jobs are full-time jobs. Moreover, we've seen significant inward investment into the UK after the referendum. <clears throat> Clearly, there are near-term uncertainties. Those near-term uncertainties, as we explain in the book, and indeed as I highlighted during the referendum campaign, could lead to what I call a sort of Nike swoosh or a tick in the sense that the economy could see slower near-term growth, not have a recession. But the reality of the situation is that the economy has grown in terms of steady growth and seen high employment. Of course, the challenge has been that the pound has fallen. But remember, before the referendum, even the International Monetary Fund and most city forecasters said that a fall in the pound was inevitable even if we voted to remain in. It was seen as being at least 15% overvalued. The weakness of the pound has led to a pickup in inflation. Inflation is about to peak. And as we move through next year, just as we saw after the financial crisis when the pound then last fell, that feed through of inflation into the economy is short lived. As we move into next year, I would expect to see higher wages, declining inflation, and see a better standard of living. So really what we've seen post-referendum has been a sign that the economy has held its ground. Naturally, the squeeze on living standards has been an inevitable near-term consequence, but at some stage the pound would have fallen anyway. I think what we can do is look ahead with confidence to what lies ahead, particularly when we reposition the UK in what is clearly a growing global economy. Is it a fair assessment to say that the EU holds all the cards in these negotiations? Well, the reality of the situation is that once we've decided to go down the Article 50 route, then the European Union does set the terms, and that's the reality of it. In Clean Brexit, we outline how to make a success of leaving the EU, but at the same time, we do say that we think the government could have done one or two things better. In particular, we felt that the government should have decided to give EU citizens rights straight away. We shouldn't use that as a bargaining chip, even though the government would argue that they're not. At the same time, I think we should have spent a bit more money sooner to actually re-equip our ports, to actually make the technology better. So there are certain things I think we could have done already to execute the process better. But in terms of Article 50, once we've gone down that route, then it's clear that the EU does set the terms, as we're seeing. That's why it's very important for the government to have a clear strategy. We've argued in the book for a temporary transition agreement that will help mitigate business uncertainty. And at the same time, also in the book Clean Brexit, we outline that the government should be prepared to have a plan to walk away and trade under World Trade Organization terms. But of course, given the importance of the UK as a market to the EU, given the importance of the UK in terms of military capability, etc., there's every likelihood that we will do a deal with the European Union. But you're quite, quite right from your question. Once we go down Article 50, then they are in the ascendancy in one respect in terms of setting the bulk of the agenda. So your question really is, why don't we opt for a soft Brexit? Well, let's remember the whole terminology in this debate, hard versus soft, has been set by the Remain side to give the idea that a soft Brexit is somehow good and cuddly and nice and hard Brexit is harsh. The reality is that people vote for all sorts of reasons. The referendum showed that people voted for sovereignty, migration or economic reasons. Sovereignty is about returning lawmaking. Migration, it was about having a sensible migration policy. Not no migration, but a sensible migration policy. And in terms of the economy, it was about the fact that the single market and membership of the EU was not working for everyone. Clearly working for big banks, big companies, but not everyday person. Therefore, we need to reposition ourselves. We can only do that 
with a clean Brexit. We have to be outside the single market to return lawmaking and set a migration policy. We have to be outside the customs union to avoid the protectionist stance of the EU. And remember, it's one of the most protectionist regions in the world. And also outside the customs union to cut trade deals with the rest of the world. A soft Brexit means we basically are half in and half out. Indeed, in the referendum, this argument itself was used by the Remain side to argue about not leaving. But why would we want, therefore, to suddenly decide to become a rule taker, not a rule maker? Why would we decide to remain in something that's clearly destined, as we've seen since the referendum, to go down the path of ever closer union? In clean Brexit, we argue the clear case about being outside the EU. And it's not just about our relationship with the EU. We've outlined clear reasons to have a domestic economic agenda where we need to be investing more in our economy and actually setting domestic policies to suit our best long-term interests. For instance, policies for our fishery industry, policy for deprived areas, the ability to return cohesion policy and to return competency in terms of regional policies and other areas across the UK. All of these things are not possible with a so-called soft Brexit, but are possible and certainly achievable and worthwhile with a clean break.